Well, welcome back to our study of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Last week, uh, we jumped right into the book to start off and actually only got through the first seven verses. And so I'll get to review a little bit with you. Uh, we are in both of the books, uh, have an overall topic I've given it, Christ's coming. It's the Believer's Departure Manual. Part two would be 2 Thessalonians. Um, this is who I am and how you can reach me. Uh, if you were coming to my adult Bible class where you'd come in the door, uh, there'd be a hard copy lesson sheet run off for you, and uh, you'd put it in your notebook, and then take notes based upon that, upon that. Um, you are welcome to email me, and I'll send you a hard copy of the lesson. If you'd like it, just specify what one you would like. And folks ask me from time to time, where do you go to church? And here it is for a New Testament Baptist Church in Largo. All right, the outline that we have been looking at, uh, we are in chapter two, and chapter two is all about correction. And there, Paul gives an expl explanation to the perplexed, the people that just, I don't get it. And as we saw last week, um, in the first few verses, um, actually, he deals with clearing up in the verse, verse 12 of clearing up of the end times. Uh, we looked at the following away of uh, the falling away before Christ comes back and the, the man of sin in the first few verses. And it'd probably be a good idea for me to use the chart we've been using and just share with you what was going on. The Thessalonians, Paul told them about the rapture in the first book of, of in chapter four of First Thessalonians and in other places, the return of the Lord. He talked about the day of the Lord also. And they are two different events. One, the rapture is at the very first part of the seven year tribulation, and we are not in the tribulation. We are waiting for the rapture, the return of the Lord. To, we meet him in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which remain will be caught up together to be with the Lord, and then he'll take us back to heaven. That's in verse 1 that we looked at. Then, all the way to the far end, there's a seven-year tribulation. At the far end, you see it says return of Christ in glory. That's where Jesus comes back with his saints and with his angels and defeats the Antichrist, and that is the day of the Lord. Really, it's a day of judgment upon earth. Uh, the Bible also calls it in the Old Testament the times of Jacob's troubles. And uh, that this begins right about at seal number six when God uh, starts judging earth with plagues and with, with just great cataclysmic events that, that happen. The first four seals are are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so that's Antichrist is number one, and then war, famine, and death. Uh, then number five is our deaths. They have, the Antichrist seeks Christians and kills them. And then six, God starts the judgments. And so the, the, for the people at the church of Thessalonica thought they were in the tribulation, according to verse two. And they, and Paul writes to him and says, no, you're not. You're not in the tribulation. You're not, you're not waiting for the day of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord upon the earth. That you've got it all messed up. And so he straightens them out. And what he does is he talks away, he says, look, let me just tell you a few things. There's going to be a falling away before Jesus comes back. He hasn't come back yet, but there's going to be a falling away. People are going to turn their backs on God. People that profess to know Christ or be Christians are, are going to do an about face. In fact, they will not just remain neutral, but they will join the side of, of evil, of Satan's crowd, of, of the Christ deniers. And then it talks about the man of sin, and then, the, then we jump in to some of the things about him. Last week, we ended up with a, with a study of the three verses. It talks about the removal of the restrainer or the Holy Spirit. And we saw six, seven, and eight because they didn't understand that in, in the day and age that we live in today, we know the Holy Spirit dwells within us, 
but the Bible tells us he's the restrainer. He's the middle between good and bad. He's the buffer zone between, he's holding back the forces of evil and satanic influences from just becoming widespread and dominant in the world and godliness. And so the, our part that we need to do as God's people is we need to win more people to the Lord and we need to live more godly. The world needs to see godliness in us to desire to be godly and to want to know what, hope, what is the hope that we have in us? Why are you different? And we saw verses 6, and I'll just read over it quickly. And now we know what we holds or restrains, that he, capital H, the Holy Spirit, might be revealed in his time, made open or known. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity uh, does already work. The satanic, the, the spirit of Antichrist actually is already starting. And only he who now lets or holds back or restrains the Holy Spirit will restrain and he'll continue that ministry is what this verse is talking about until the Lord pulls him out of the world. And that will happen at the rapture. So when Christ comes and we're gone, the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn also. And I said last week, and this isn't a, in a crass way, but hell on earth does literally for the first time break loose. And... Antichrist will lead the way, but Satan will be pulling the strings. Okay, uh, this is brand new, and this is what I promised last week. Um, I have some really cool issues, uh, not issues, but lists and things. Uh, the first, In the first place, 10 things that the Holy Spirit is to us. Um, as I was researching this and learning this and looking up some of my notes from the past, um, I ran across a list of 50 things, but I said that I'm not going there. Um, you can go on your own study and see how many you can find of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in the world and what his ministry is today. Let's just look at them very quickly because this is very important. And nevertheless, I tell you the truth in John. It is expedient for you that I go away. Jesus is talking. For if I don't go away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And so Jesus, when he left, sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to comfort us. If you ever need comfort, if you ever need help, turn within first. Look at your heart and in prayer, seek the Holy Spirit and seek the comfort that the Spirit of God can give our heart. To let us know with the child of God, all, all things can be well even though we ache and we hurt. Number two, the Bible says that he sanctifies us. The word sanctify means that he, that we are, when we're saved, he continues to wash us and to, that we are set aside for a specific purpose to live for the Lord. And such were some of you, but you're washed. He was talking about people that were vile and bad people. He said, some of you are that way. He says, you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, but you're sanctified. And you've been justified in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we're sanctified, we're set aside to, be, to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about he gives us gifts. These would be called the Spirit gifts. You can find verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit. And you can read about the gifts there in the rest of the verses. He gives us hope in Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you all with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. If you want hope, the Holy Spirit is the God of hope. He's that aspect that not just will comfort us, not just lead us, we'll see that in a minute, but he will give us hope when we don't see the way out. The Bible says that he also teaches us, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, whatever I've said unto you. This is wonderful. When I, when I get into a roadblock and I just don't understand and I don't get it, and I've looked and I've done research and I've talked to people, and one of the first things I do is I walk away from it. I say, I don't want to start researching. I don't want to start looking at this. Let me just pray about this and see if my dumb mind and the block I have there 
will just fall away. And many times it does. If it doesn't, I keep praying and I then I go researching, I check it. But you know what? Inevitably, I come to the answer because the Lord promised that the Holy Spirit will teach us what we don't understand. He guides us. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we'd pray for. He'll, we don't always know how to pray for it or what to pray for, but the Spirit will guide us, for the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which can't be uttered. The Spirit will guide us in our prayer life. He convicts the world of sin. That's part of his aspect of being a buffer, uh, of being the go-in between, the hold back, the refrainer of evil. And when he has come, the Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He fills us and be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. How we need, we have, as a child of God, we have the Spirit in us. How, we, how filled we are is how much, how much of us is in the cup. He will seal us, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, they were saved. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Then the Holy Spirit seals, uh, sealed with that, the, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I was getting ahead of myself. After we're saved, when we are saved, <coughs> the Holy Spirit will seal us and give us the sh assurance of our salvation that we know the Lord Jesus Christ and are eternally born again. And then on to number 10, he dwells within us, Romans 8, 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells or dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's not any of his. If he doesn't have the spirit, he's not a Christian. He doesn't not know the Lord. On to verse eight. And then shall that wicked, actually in the Greek it would read wicked one or lawless one, be revealed. After the Holy Spirit is taken out of this world, Antichrist will appear on the scene. The tribulation is just starting. And so he's telling them, Paul's telling them, this is how, it, this is how the tribulation will come about that you think you're living in now, but you're not. If you're a child of God to the Thessalonians, you will not even be here. And if you're a child of God today, you will not even be here. The tribulation is not come and gone. And so he says, when the wicked one will be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so the wicked one will come on the scene. And at the end of the tribulation, the, 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 the Lord will consume, will literally, the Bible says, consume, destroy. The word destroy means to bring to naught, to put out a commission, render him ineffective. In the brightness or the glorious appearing of his coming back with his angels and with the saints to defeat not just Antichrist, but the false prophet, the wicked rulers and the wickedness of the world. And Jesus will set up his throne here on earth and there'll be a thousand year reign on earth where King Jesus is on the throne. All right, now, once again, just so they don't get it, the Apostle Paul goes back and he repeats a little bit more. And he talks a little bit more about the appearance of the lawless one in just a few verses. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. All right, here's some more about the man of sin or the, about the Antichrist. And ab, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan's. Antichrist will appear on the scene after Satan has worked and set up the world as he has maneuvered people into positions, high places, rulers, people that uh, control you, uh, economies, control things online controls media things, uh, controls even churches. Satan will move his people and it'll be all set up and it'll be like rolling out a red carpet for the Antichrist to appear on the scene. And he will do so with power, lots of power, and with signs and lying wonders. Now, the word work here, working, means it's very effective. It's very effective what he does. 
And I said, he rolls out a ray. It's like a, it's a perfect setup for an Antichrist to come. And it's used in conjunction with the supernatural where people will say, wow, look at that. That's, I can't believe that's a miracle. Those are unbelievable. But they are lying wonders, the Bible says. There'll be signs and lying wonders. They're, they're, they're trickery. They're not, they're not genuine. And with all, it continues on, he says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, unrighteousness is wrongdoing in them that perish. They, the Antichrist, Satan is setting up the Antichrist and, the, and his reign and will deceive people. He's lying. He's not telling the truth, but people will believe the lie. Because they, because they receive not the love of the truth, the word receive means they gladly receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. See, within the word of God is the truth. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth. Jesus is the truth. The word of God is the truth. And they heard it, and they just shrugged it off. And they didn't receive it gladly. They just said, oh, okay, that's nice at the best. Many of them just angry and might have, might have walked away in a, after saying harsh things to the child of God that shared the Bible and shared Christian things with them. So this is, this is the course of our world and how things are coming and where we are headed for and some of the things that are going to happen. So keep in mind with these two verses, this coming of the Antichrist will be set up, red carpeted by Satan, and will lead off when Antichrist shows up on the scene to, for him to take power, and he's a powerful person, but he will use lying wonders, he will use deception, and he will fool the unrighteous, he will fool the people that do not know the Lord. And uh, those are the people that didn't receive the Lord, that they were not saved. That's pretty clear what Paul's sharing with them and what Paul's giving to them. All right. Um, I looked up and I made a list of all of the New Testament names for the Antichrist. And I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm going to give you homework. And you say, oh, joy, I'm not going to be coming back and listening to you again. i uh, Please go home and look these verses up and check them over. And it's alphabetical, and I've sort of color-coded them back and forth. But let me just talk them out loud to you, and then I'll move on. Uh, the Antichrist is an angel of the bottomless pit. He's Antichrist. He's called the beast in Revelation. The father of the lie, 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Lawless one, and, and, or Thessalonians, rather. Look at all the Thessalonians' references to the Antichrist. He's a lawless one. He's a man of sin. Later on, he's the prince of darkness. We've seen that. He's a son of perdition. And then the verse or the, the books that I did, uh, did not allude to, up in John chapter 5, he's the one who comes in his own name or his own power and his own power and strength. The Bible calls him a star, but Jesus is the bright morning star. Satan is a morning star, but Jesus is the bright and morning star, the more powerful one. Uh, Antichrist is an unclean spirit. And we see finally in Revelation, he's a, a vine out of the earth, not out of heaven. So those are some of the names of Antichrist. And I want to close with another list. But you don't necessarily have to look this up because we're going to be leaving Antichrist after after this slide actually and moving on i just want to share with you um how is it that he can take over and be world world ruler and be accepted as that and wanted as that because he is empowered by satan not the lord these are the things and the and the and the strengths that he comes and the references of what's coming out of this. He's an intellectual genius. 
He's oratorically a genius. He knows how to speak. He could, he's got a glib tongue. He'd make a great actor, and he is. He's political genius, commercial genius. He knows, he knows how to handle economies. He's a military genius because he fights wars and battles, and all until the end of Revelation, he wins them. To, to the end of the seven-year tribulation, he wins them. He's a governmental genius. He knows how to take power and use power. And probably the worst of all, he's a religious genius. He knows, he knows how to talk the talk. And he can walk it. But he's, all, he's a phony for, on either one of them. He knows the truth, but he denies it. And he gladly does that because he's a hater of God's people, the Jews, and of God's people, the Christians. He hates anything of God, anything of the Son of God, anything of Jesus. So I think probably the worst, worst thing on this list, as I said to you, that he's a religious genius. How sad it is. You can be religious, and, and most people that are religious are lost. They don't know Christ as Savior. I close the today with this is a lot of material again, and I will finish chapter two next week, but I give this to you. Uh, there's a couple of charts on here that just for your education and your information. And if you don't look them up, that's okay. You know where they are. You can come back and find them another time. May I say this? We li we're living in the last days, I believe. Jesus could come back at any minute. If you're not ready, you can be. You can be born again. You can be a child of God. You can know your sins are forgiven. Go to the Lord in prayer and confess your, your heart of sin because no one can pay for it except two people, you in hell or Jesus who already did on the cross. And if you will pray and confess your sin and, and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, and to come into your heart, the love of God is so great, you will be forgiven of all of your sin. And Jesus will come and live within you, give you his Holy Spirit. You'll become a child of God. You'll be a different person. And if, when Christ comes back, you'll meet him in the air. You will meet him in the air and go to heaven to be with him. What a wonderful truth that that is. God bless you. I wish you the best. And keep looking up. Jesus is coming back.